when I was in kindergarten, I was sitting at a table doing artwork, and those tables in those days had little squares. Do you remember those little squares? And um, all of a sudden, in one of these squares, plopped this great big wad of blood. And I looked up, and here this guy, boy was having a nosebleed. I saw all this, but I just threw up my hands and ran home. And if I was sick, and I had to be given some pills, it took uh, an act of Congress to get a pill down me. So you can see that, that I was not prepared to be a nurse by any means. We had to take the train, and we had to take the the ferry, and then the streetcar out to the hospital. And um, so she was taken in to, to uh, fill out the form. In the meantime, this, a lady came up to me and asked me if I was waiting for to be interviewed. And I said, oh, no, no, not at all. And she said, wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to be a, a nurse? And I said, no, I, not at all. And I said, I, I just have a phobia about uh, about blood. I just uh, couldn't possibly be a nurse. And she said, oh, you won't see any blood as a nurse. I said, how come? She said, we, have, we always clean it up before you you, <laughs> you would see it. And uh, But she said, do you like babies and, and small children? Oh, yeah, I love babies. I love working with them. And uh, oh, yeah, I, I like that. And she said, well, that's what we are. This is a woman's in children's hospital and you'll have lots of fun with babies. So that sounded a little better to me, you know. And so I said, well, that didn't sound bad. She said, why don't you just come in and fill out a form and you can think about it. So I didn't know I was filling out an application. So I filled the whole thing out and uh, went home and forgot about it. In a couple of weeks I got a letter from them saying that they had accepted my application. And I said, my Lord, what do I do now? And uh, because uh, we had cut school, you know, and uh, and I hadn't told my mother about this, and um, and first of all, they would have you know a fit to think I was going to go in training, and so um, I just really was upset. But I didn't say anything. I said, Carol, what do I do? And she said, Well, oh, just wait. We'll see. Well, pretty soon I got a, a letter from them saying they wanted me to come to have a physical examination and another interview with my parents, my mother or my father. Well, there and I was really in, in it, and I had to tell my mother. And I told her and my dad, and my father thought it was funny. Father thought it was the funniest thing he ever heard of. He said she'd be the worst nurse they'd ever had. And my mother said, well, I think I will go over. I want to see what this is all about. And so she went over, and uh, and the uh, interviewer uh, really did a number on my mother. My mother thought she was just wonderful. And I'd be under her care, she thought, you know. And um, so she, she came home and told my dad. She said, that'll be good for her, you, you know. <laughs> I think it's going to be good for uh, Virginia to, to uh, get some uh, discipline. And um, and so <laughs> my father laughed. He said, well, how long do you think that's going to last, you know? We worked 12 hours. I worked from 7 at night to 7 in the morning, but I really never got off much before 9 o'clock in the morning. And uh, I got, uh, for nights, we, got, we, we were paid $85 a month. That didn't include anything. It didn't include laundry. For, you had to wear, you know, white uniforms. It didn't. Um, 
include dinner or or <clears throat> anything. There was no no vacation time, no sick time, nothing. And um, but it was during the depression, and um, it was lucky. I mean, I I was happy to have the job. And he said, I'll pay you $135 a month. I thought I was rich as a quote. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. $135. I couldn't count that high, I thought. I said, I'll take it right away. Well, I really worked hard for that $135. He was a very busy man. And um, we uh, uh, had evening hours. And in those days, the doctor made house calls. and. He would start at seven. I had to be there at eight o'clock to write down all the calls that he was where he would be in case another call, another home call, and I'd call and say, "Doctor, you've got to go to such and such a place." And then he'd come in in the afternoon, and we'd work until six, and then sometimes two nights a week, uh, he came back, and we worked until ten at night. They were so in need of nurses that there was uh, a word out that they were going to start drafting nurses. And I thought, well, I better get in and go where I want to go rather than to be drafted. So I um, joined the Navy. I had uh, went to Merrill Island, uh, which is in Vallejo, Northern California. And Merrill Island was a process thesis center for for the West Coast, they put me in OB because I was the only nurse that was trained for OB and the first time the Navy, I think, ever put somebody in that they were trained in because the OB, the chief of OB was an orthopedic surgeon and the chief of the nursery was a dermatologist. And honest to goodness, the, the interns, you know, uh, they had cut down their time so that they had never even seen a baby born, some of them. And I tell you, I hid all the forceps, I hid everything, because I was scared to death that they would try to use them. And they finally put me in, in enlisted men's infirmary. Well, they, the corpsman had never taken care of a woman let alone a nurse, and they were scared to death of me. And I don't remember very much for a couple of days, but I know I perspired profusely. So when I was feeling better, I asked the corpsman, I said, I need, I need a bath. Would you bring me a, you know, a, a, some water and, uh, and I'll give myself a bath? So he said, okay. So he put a, a bath towel under me, and then he left. And so I stripped myself off, and, and boy, I had the best time. I was scrubbing away, and I had this leg up, and I thought, oh, I was going by. I said, gee whiz, I've lost some weight. And all of a sudden, I had this feeling something was... And now, over here was this Carmen standing, and he'd come in, and he, here I was stark naked, and he didn't know how to get out, and he was like this. <laughs> and I said, uh, I said... I think you better leave. <laughs> he turned around. I never saw that kid again. There were about eight of us, and um, we got out in a couple of hours, maybe more. And all of a sudden, um, one of them said, you know, I've got a feeling that we're going in the wrong direction. And I said, yeah, it does seem strange. And pretty soon they came aboard and said, we, we have to go back to Pearl. We're having an engine problem. Well, we thought for sure they'd run into some Japanese, you know. And so we were scared to death until we got back. And um, it took another four hours to get back with a, with a, a engine that was sputtering and sputtering. So we were, I was there again overnight, another, I think it was two days before they got the plane ready and then we flew right out. And we flew right to Guam. 
And uh, when I got to Guam, uh, uh, some uh, officers met us in a jeep. And uh, we, our uniform overseas was uh, gray. Our, I had a gray sea sucker dress that we all wore. And um, the men wore a gray shirt and gray pants. Well, they came to pick us up, and I looked at the men, and they were all wet. And I said, my God, they wet their pants. How can this be? And it wasn't long before I realized that we were all perspiring, and they had been in the Jeep, sitting in the Jeep, and they just perspired. And of course, that gray, you know how it... Well, I tell you, it was... <laughs> We learned very quickly that uh, you really felt the humidity. I don't know if you want to hear this story, but I had a, a patient come on my ward. He had been flown in from his, an island. It didn't have any hospital or didn't have any clinics. Just the Carmen had to take care of a little sick bay. And this man had been shot, and um, and he and he had pneumonia. They decided he was going to die, so they put him on a on a ship, and he, they shipped him in to me. Well, I just don't want to tell you the state that that man was in. It was just awful. It was abs absolutely awful. And um, I was so mad because I knew nobody had taken care of him at all. And I called them, all my corpsmen in, and I said, I want you, want you to see what happens when you, neg when you neglect a patient. And I made them stay with me while I cleaned them up. My grandfather, great-grandfather, was on the Underground Railroad. You know what that is? Mm -hmm. And so my father grew up with, with that. And they had my great, my grandfather, his father, had a, had a farm, but he also had a, um, he raised horses, and he had a, a, he had a, a several colored men who, who ran the, ran the race. He had also a racetrack that he taught the where the horses were taught, and so Dad would go over, and and um, but enjoy being with with these men that would train in the horses. So Dad had a great deal of respect for. I mean, as far as he knew, there was no difference between a colored man and a white man. That's the way he was brought up. And so that's the way I was brought up. Poor man, uh, after I was working with him and got him a little more comfortable, he looked at me and he said, you must be an angel. <laughs> and I think he must have thought he'd gone to heaven because somebody was he was in a nice bed and comfortable and warm and and... Anyway, that was because he was colored, and they weren't going to take care of him. I, we had too much of that. When uh, the war was over with Japan, then uh, we got the POWs. And to me, that was the worst part of the war, absolutely the worst part for me, because these men came back, and they were just bucket cases, basket cases, uh, in terrible condition. And one of them gave me a little little dish about this size. Judy has it. She wanted to keep it. That that was filled with rice three times a day. That's what they got. And <clears throat> they, they were, it was just awful. I was engaged to boy who was he was going to he was going to fight those Japanese by his own hands. He was a lawyer, but he went in as a enlisted man, and he wanted to be with the enlisted man. He did not want to go in and be an officer. Well, they caught up with him, and the next thing they made him go to officer's training school and uh, and uh, he was down at Camp Pendleton. And um, we were going to get married, but we, there was no place to live. I mean, everything was taken. And um, we thought there was no point in uh, getting married when you don't have 
Tom was killed on Iwo Jima, and um, and uh, he he had uh, uh, gotten through three days, but you know they didn't know. They thought they had the island secure. They didn't know that it was mined, and um, that that there were caves uh, all through that uh, island. And of course, there were. They had a big, big uh, fight after that. But uh, a sniper got him, and um, I knew about it because his one of his men was with him, and he brought him to the hospital ship, and then he got in touch with his mother, who got in touch with me. Oh, it was around Christmas time, and I got my orders to come home. And I came home on a ship that, I always say it must have been an LST, I don't know what it was, but it, it just rolled like this. We really had a very bad storm. We had a, um, a lifeboat outside of our, our porthole, and it would bang, 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 and you know, all all this time. And finally the thing just fell off. And so the, we were <laughs> we were happy about that. But I eventually went out and just slept out on the deck. And then uh, the captain called me, I was the only nurse aboard, and uh, asked me if I would go down in the hold. They had, I don't know how many soldiers, uh, um, not soldier Marines and uh, and Navy people. Um, they were at the in the hold taking them home. Well, they all got seasick, and um, I, I, you know, you can imagine. And um, but there was nothing to treat them. He wanted me to go down and treat them. We didn't have any seven up or anything like that to give them. We had nothing, and the water was uh, tasted salty. That made them even worse. And, uh, oh gosh, I didn't know what to do. I, there wasn't much I could do but hold our hands. But when it got to be, when we finally got calmed down, so that I got them all moved out on the deck and then they all felt better, so did I. And I never got out of my out of my uniform. I went right from, practically from the <laughs> ship to the hospital, and I took care of him for almost a year, and he died. And um, but for a year he was, he uh, he was able. He got a prosthesis, and he 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 wasn't going to die as far as he was concerned. But uh, of course, it went to his chest. You know, today's that wouldn't happen. You know, we can save them now. They shouldn't have amputated, for one thing. And um, uh, because the doctor knew he was, that, that wasn't a cure. And um, he tricked, uh, we didn't want, they, my folks didn't want him to know that he was going to have an amputation. Uh, and, um, but he tricked uh, one of the interns in to tell him um, and by say, talking about lay, uh, talking to the intern about treatments and what they do, and and, they, and this guy goes on and says, well, we we amputate and so on. Right away, he knew that he was going to be amputated. So when I went in the early morning to get him ready for surgery, he said, um, "Yeah, they're going to take off my leg, aren't they?" And I I was just I was just sick. I didn't want him to go into surgery, you know, with that, but I, 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 wanted, I wanted his folks to be able to sit down and talk to him and tell him what, what had happened and why they had to do this and what they were going to do afterwards and, and um, you know, sort of give them tender, loving care. And, and that didn't happen, you know. But they certainly gave him a lot of it when it was out, but they just, they didn't really know uh, how to handle it either. So, but it broke my heart. He was a, just a great kid. So my uncle bought him a car and he just had one year of having a good time. And then uh, when he became 
ill where I had to take care of him in the hospital. Uh, I had him, he went into a, <clears throat> into a coma. I, about two in the morning, he woke up and he said, hi. He said, I'm hungry. And I said, you're hungry? And he said, yeah, what can, I, what can I have? And I said, what would you like? A peanut butter sandwich, jelly sandwich. You know, and I said, really, you think you want that? And he said, I sure do. So I went out and got him a peanut butter sandwich and jelly, and he ate it with relish. And then he said, you know, I want to get married. <laughs> and I said, you had a girlfriend. And then he said, I said, get married? Yeah, he said, you, you, she, she, she wants to marry me. You call a priest and tell him to come. And, and he was just insistent, and I had the worst time saying, well, you know, the priest won't come because you don't have a marriage license, and I, he will not come. And I finally calmed him down, and he went to sleep and then died. And I sat there for about an hour, and I just swear, I, I just felt that his, I just felt that he, his soul was, there was, it was a, an experience that I just, I don't know. And, and part of the home nursing was to teach mothers how to bathe their babies and how to make formulas. In those days, we had to make formulas. And um, we had classes to have them come prenatal and so on. And uh, so I did that. And um, now Marin City was where the um, uh, many, many, <laughs> I would say refugees from, from the United States, uh, came to work in the shipyards uh, d during the war. And they stayed there in this Marin City. And it was, it, the homes were just really put together with paste and, <laughs> and um, they were, when I, we would go to Marin City to take care of former uh, uh, soldiers' wives, because um, they were put base there. And uh, I swear, the walls were so thin you could poke a hole in the wall and the next family over. You could hear everything in the next room. I don't know how the people managed, but they did. They had shelter. That was the main thing. Of course, he didn't even have a seat for me. He had to sit on a pail. There was no seat on this side, and he had to get a pail out. So I sat on this while we went over. And, um, and he started, a nice looking young man, and he started talking, and he said, um, you know, he said, um, I was a CB. Now, he didn't know I was a Navy nurse, and believe me, I didn't tell him. Uh, he said I was a CB, and he said, you know, uh, when we got back, we didn't get any any recognition whatsoever. And he said, uh, uh, I'd come back and people were meeting the boats with the Marines coming off and the bands were playing and, and they had all kinds, everybody was, and we were just ignored. We didn't get any benefits, we didn't get anything. And he said, it just drove me crazy to the point where my doctor told me that I had to get away that I, to go off someplace by yourself and get away from people, just stay away from people until you can get yourself back together. I kept thinking about this man and how many more were there? You know, I, you, you can't put it all together. And I, I, wasn't, um, I wasn't really too familiar with the Seabees did out there, to be caught out there, you know, because it, uh, they were the ones that the prisoners of war that I took care of when they came home, came through Guam. And um, it really did, um, I, I just, um, I t it took a long time for me to try to live through that because it did disturb me. On the back ward was a man who had been in the 1906 earthquake. 
he was probably 22, and he was a schizo, and they had him in an in institution. And um, they let out all the members of these of the mental institutions to help fight the fires. That was a big thing, you know. And so he was let out, and he fought the fires. He could tell us one block after another what, you know, Fillmore, name them all. I, I could just sit there and see that fire go, you know. It was just remarkable. Well, then when the fires were over, they started rounding up all these mental Ill, mentally ill patients, but the, but the institutions had all burned down, and there was no place for them. So different states took a, a group of these patients, and he got Seabrill Willie, and he'd been there ever since. We had catatonic patients, and one of them, you could put her arm up like this and stay there, you know, and you know about catatonic. Well, anyway, she, she had been uh, <coughs> there for a couple of years and um, got pneumonia. And um, so uh, they had a special nurse for her, and then they sent her down to a, to a uh, the hospital part uh, care hospital care part, and um, and she she had special nurses, but she was still catatonic. But one day she said something to the nurse, "Thank you," and the nurse said, "What did you know?" Because she never hadn't spoken for a couple of years. What did you say? She said, "I said thank you," and she, she ran out of the room, scared her. She said, she's talking, she's talking. Oh, no, you know, you're hearing things. They went in, and by golly, she started to talk. And so, little by little, she got better. And the doctor the, asked her, he said, you know, he said, what, what do you suppose brought you into the point where you could start talking again? Well, she said, you know, my two sisters used to come to see me all the time. And they live in Seattle. They have quite a ways to come. And then they spent all this money to get me well. I damned well needed to get well. And you know, she got well and went home. My assignment was over in uh, Pleasant and Livermore in that area. And <clears throat> and uh, we were living outside of Oakland. And I had to... I had to take the uh, freeway. Where at those days, it was not much of a freeway, and um, <clears throat> it was a dangerous um, ride. And um, But I had um, I had five, uh, six one-room schoolhouses where I would go and visit once every so often to do hearing and vision tests and, and a small uh, <clears throat> Uh, sort of check them over a little bit, and uh, but and then I I uh, part of my uh, <clears throat> assignment was to follow up TB patients through the Alameda County Hospital, and um, that took me to the vineyards where I would be checking the the men who worked in the fields. And um, a good percentage of them would come up positive. And so we would send them in free to the Alameda County Hospital where they were given medication. And I'd follow them up to be sure that they went. And um, if I would go there to, the, to follow up somebody that hadn't shown up, he was gone Well, somebody he'd gotten picked up. And I knew if I waited long enough, he'd be back. You know, they'd, they'd get back some way. Every Monday morning, we would go over to the prison uh, and do um, smears, vaginal smears, do a vasemen, and um, they were drug addicts. And they were picked up off the streets in Oakland and around and brought in. And usually they were brought in time and time again, the same people, because they would come in to to cut themselves down. There was a name for it, I've forgotten what it was. So they didn't need quite as much, you know, 
whatever they were taking, they could cut it down. And then when they'd build it up where they couldn't afford it anymore, they'd go and get themselves down. But I tell you, uh, it was very difficult because they, you could hear them screaming all over the place. It was just awful to go in there screaming because they were, they wanted the, you know, the drugs, and of course now they were in prison and couldn't get it. That was all public health, and um, and so then um, I had that's uh, I had been there. I worked there a couple of years when I met my husband, and then I got married and. Uh, we eventually moved on to come to uh, uh, Glendale. I substituted, and you know, from that point on, I was, I was there. <laughs> I had in sixth grade, we used to pick up a lot of fifth and sixth, a lot of vision problems. We had a teacher in the sixth grade, a man teacher young guy, and the, the sixth grade girls just loved him. And all of a sudden, I got a bunch of girls coming in. They, they, did, they, they couldn't see, they were having trouble with their eyes. They were doing this. And I got too many squinters. I thought, what is going on in that room? So I thought, I'm gonna go in and visit that room. So I went in and I watched, what was his name? He went down to the board. Um, anyway, you might have known him. I have to think of his name. Nice looking guy. Anyway, he went, and I went back, and here he was back there. I could just, I thought, there is the answer. He needed to wear glasses, but he didn't want to wear them. And if he squinted, so were they going to squint? <laughs> oh, dear. That was funny. <clears throat> You'd learned a lot in the classroom if you'd go in and sit for a while. The nurse who was at the school checking for head lice, she found this little girl had had head lice. And, um, and she called me, she said, I can't call this mother. She said, this mother will not accept it. And she said, uh, I, have, I, just, uh, I have any relationship with her at all. So I said, well, I'll call her. So I called her. <clears throat> And I explained to her that her child had head lice. No, she didn't have that. And I said, I beg your pardon? She said, no, she didn't have head lice. She said, you know, she goes to, I don't know what she thought, I didn't know about school. She goes to a, a, a different school than the rest in Glendale. And she said, um, they're all bright children there at that school. There wouldn't be any head lice there. And I said, I'm, unfortunately, headlights don't know the difference between a bright child and a child that's not so bright. She absolutely refused to say that this child had headlights. And I said, I happen to have, uh, I'll give you some headlights that we took out of her head, out of her hair. And you have to come and pick her up. She is not allowed in school until you can prove to me that she no longer has head nice, and the doctor will give you an, a, an order. Well, I tell you, she, and I thought she was going to call the superintendent of schools, but she finally did come and get the child, and she did see the head lice. We had, we had quite a program in those days where we, um, the children were all children uh, at from age Kindergarten, first grade, uh, third grade, sixth grade at the elementary level, level had hearing tests and vision tests and and um, and and uh, also uh, physicals. And then we had a dentist uh, at the fourth grade level, and she went through and checked your teeth. And it was a woman, I remember. And um, so our children got a lot of extra care. Little by little, little by little, it's been all taken away, all of it. But um, in those days, for instance, children who had been out more than three days had to see the nurse, and you remember that as, and uh, we had to check them in, and uh, then teachers, if they were out two weeks, we had to, they had to check in with us, and um, 
And if they were out more than two weeks, I had to make a house call to see what the problem was. And we, we had ways of getting the children in children's hospital. Uh, none of that is done anymore, you know. It's just, uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm not around to see all that. It, it breaks my heart. You train so hard, work so hard to, to make life easier. It doesn't work, does it? No. We set up a um, blood pressure clinic, and we we started out with about three patients, and we ended up with lining up around the. We, we had to take it out of the Red Cross and set up a clinic down at the uh, uh, the health department, and uh, we um, and then I volunteered at the health department itself uh, to. Uh, help with giving shots to the children and, and assessments and so on. But we picked up a lot of patients who needed needed uh, to see the doctors, and then patients who had been seeing the doctors, uh, but not, you know, as soon as they should or recently. They'd stay on the same medication, and, but, and maybe after a year they needed to be elevated or lowered. And, um, and so we was, we would, you know, tell them to go back and see their doctor. And we had doctors thank us for sending, sending patients to them. I don't know if they still do that now or not. I never had any children. I lost two babies, one at five months and one at four. So that was the end of that. So anyway, but I, I had lots of little baby friends, so I didn't, uh, and I was older, so I knew that, uh, you know, someday I, I would need some need somebody to look after me I, with my vision being so poor, and I had to give up driving, it's like losing your right arm, and, um, and so I, I knew that I had to do something uh, and I, I looked around every place. I, gosh, I went when Judy was even when she was still in in Fresno. I went up there and looked up there. Now Judy is kind of like my my daughter. <laughs> she, uh, her mother and dad <clears throat> divorced when she was a practically a baby, and her mother had been. She was in, in uh, she trained at the same school I did, but. Uh, a few years later, and um, I was ill with uh, pneumonia, and I was in the <clears throat> in those days in an oxygen tent in the hospital, and they were tents, and um, you had a big, you could hear the ice, you know, bang, bang, banging all the time, and I had to have a special nurse, and so my doctor asked me, he said, "Who do you want?" There? He told me who was on the list, and here was Connie, I didn't know her. But she was from Children's Hospital where I trained. I said, get her. And uh, that became my lifelong friendship. Some of it I don't like and some of it I do. But I do feel we need, we need care. We need health care. And we fought against it. Now we've got a foot in the door, but I don't think it's going to stay there. I'm afraid it's going to be. What do you think? How are we going? To, how are we going to set it up? I don't know. I don't know. But somehow we have to have it, and and you know I was paying um, seven hundred dollars a month for my insurance. Now, how many people can afford that? I'm paying a third less, imagine, and getting the same care. So there, there's something wrong, and um, uh, there's making millions of dollars in the insurance companies, 
And you know when when Blue Cross sold to to um, what is it Antium, millions of dollars those men were given and millions to sell out. Uh, that was some of my money. My husband died of a heart attack, so I, I, but my mother I'd cared for for quite a while, and that was helpful. But from my own standpoint, I don't know. I, I guess it helped being a nurse, but sometimes it isn't so helpful because you know too much. <laughs> you know, you think, oh, gosh, maybe it's something worse than, you, than it turns out to be. Um, and and you also tend to diagnose other people occasionally, <laughs> and say, I don't, "You better go back and see your doctor." I don't think that's right. <laughs> and I, sometimes I've been right. <laughs> I don't know how many times, but but I tried to get your mom. I was really worried about her, and uh, I never did get her to. Well, I guess you guys were the one who finally stepped in. But I was so concerned when she was losing weight, you know. Anyway, it's my life, and I love it here. And I plan to be here for a little while longer. <laughs> two parties. Yeah, two parties. <laughs>